There's a little red muscle that lies in your mouth that has created a lot of drama for people. A little red muscle called the tongue. Proverbs 18 speaks about it and it says about that little red muscle that there is power in that thing to produce death or life. What an incredible statement it says that power of life and death is in what you say. Y'all know that already. I know this 12 o'clock crowd knows that you said things that have killed people. You said things that encourage folk. What comes out of your mouth has the capacity and the potential of either speaking life or death. Some marriages have not survived because some folk couldn't shut their mouth down. Some kids have grown up. Some of y'all are adults today and you still have your own self-image problems because your parents never spoke anything positive or affirming in your life. Some of you are raising your kids to be, devast to be devastated because you don't know how to say anything positive about them. You keep on feeding them bad things and saying bad things about them and to them and you wonder why they don't ever do anything better because the scripture says death and life are in the power of the tongue. The words that you speak bring life or death. It would be do us good, perhaps, to take just a few moments. I'm not going to preach long. I promise I'll be done in just a few moments. But while I'm here, bam, I'm going to punch you upside your face. I'm going to hit you hard with a quick jab, bam, then I'm going to be done. It's a quick sermon, not a whole lot to say. It's very simple what it is. Boil it down to this. What you say can either bring life or death. As a matter of fact, the scripture says, and those who love it will eat its fruit. That means this, that what comes out of your mouth, you will bear the consequences of it, and you'll have to eat the fruit of what you said. If, you're, if your marriage doesn't lie, last because you kept on running your mouth, because you kept on talking negative, you'll have to eat the fruit of the consequences of that. If your children never grow up to be everything that they ought to be and could be because you never spoke any encouraging words to them, you will find yourself re eat, reaping the fruit of them coming back home, <laughs> in some cases never leaving home and living with you. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, he's preaching better than you're saying amen. <laughs> the problem is we have problems with our tongue. Matthew 12, 36 says this. I'm not turning there. Just jot it down if you're taking notes. Matthew 12, 36 says, one day we must give an account to God of every idle word. Think about what that says. That's what the scripture says. One day you and I would have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give answers and give an account of everything that you spoke out of your mouth. That's horrifying, isn't it? When you think about all the things you said, all the lies you've told, all the curse words you said. Who's in the cursing ministry? Let me see who's in the cussing ministry. Come on, be honest. How many of y'all got a cussing problem? You know that sometimes those words come out. Now, let me, let me just tell y'all this. Here's, here's what I said about y'all. Let me tell you what I said about the 12 o'clock crowd. I told the 8 o'clock service and the 10 o'clock service this. Here's what I said about it. Because each service has its own flavor to it. The 12 o'clock crowd are the honest crowd. Y'all are honest people. Y'all don't try to pretend. You don't try to cover over. You don't try to perpetrate anything. Y'all come down and talk to me after service. You say, Pastor, this is my girlfriend. We've been living together for three years. We got two kids. <laughs> they don't try to perpetrate. That's true. Pastor, I, I met my, I was in the, in the club last night. I got drunk. The 12 o'clock crowd is honest. The 8 o'clock crowd is a little different. They, they are perpetrators. The 8 o'clock crowd pretend, act like they got it all together, put on their Sunday clothes, got the tie on, look good, look religious, look like they got it all together. But the reality is they're jacked up people. The 8 o'clock crowd won't tell the truth. They won't come and say, they'll, they'll dress it over, you know. They'll just try to, you know, they won't be honest like that. I, that's what I appreciate about the 12 o'clock crowd. Y'all are honest people. See, y'all are honest. Y'all tell the truth. The 8 o'clock crowd, they come, walking in, they come walking in church holding hands like everything's great, but they just finished cussing each other out in the car before they came in. <laughs> Somebody said, well, where does that put the 10 o'clock crowd? The 10 o'clock crowd is a mixture of the 8 and the 12 o'clock crowd. <laughs> it's a blend. The 8 o'clock crowd tells lies. They perpetrate. 
So I don't have to talk about lies and stuff, because y'all y'all don't lie, y'all tell the truth. Now gossip, y'all got another problem. Y'all like to talk about people. <laughs> somebody say, what is gossip? Gossip is when you're talking with somebody about somebody and neither one of you are a part of the problem nor the solution. <laughs> Write that down. You're engaged in gossip, running your mouth, talking. That's, that's, that's one of the things your tongue can get involved in engaged. And the scripture says one day you and I will have to stand before our God and give an account of everything we say. Amen. It's a horrifying moment to think about. Every word that is ever ushered out of your mouth, you'll have to one day give an account to, it, to God. As a matter of fact, this thing about the power of the tongue, death and life in the power of the tongue, and those who live, love it will eat of its fruit. Whatever you love coming out of your mouth, you'll bear the fruit of that. James spends a whole, almost a whole chapter talking about the tongue. It is such a dangerous thing that in James chapter 3, matter of fact, turn there real quick to James chapter 3, and let's, let's look at what James has to say about the tongue. As a matter of fact, his, there are two points, and allow me just to walk through these two points. Let me tell you what they are right off the bat. Number one is the power of the tongue. He spends the first few verses of chapter 3 talking about the power of the tongue. Can I look at the power of the tongue? Okay, thank you. I'm going to look at the power of the tongue. James 3, starting at verse 2. Here's what it says. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Wow, that's powerful. Look at what he says. Let me run through that again. We all stumble in many, many areas, many things. We have problems. But if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, he says. And that word perfect doesn't mean you're, perf you're perfected. It means mature. When you've learned not to offend in what comes out of your mouth, you have reached a level of maturity. Spiritual maturity is what he's saying. Able all, and he says, you're also able to bridle the whole body. Boy, that's powerful. He says, when you get to a place where you can control your tongue and control what comes out of your mouth, there's a level of maturity to you, and that maturity will translate into you being able to live the kind of life that you need to live, to control your body. See, the problem is some of you are not able to control your body because you can't control your tongue. Look over to your neighbor and say, you can't control your body because you can't control your tongue. I like that. You can't control your body because you can't control your tongue. You can't control your body because you can't control your tongue. You can't control your body because you can't control your tongue. Get your tongue under control and your body will follow. Pastor, where you get that from? Keep on reading. Let's talk about the power of the tongue. It says right here in verse number uh, three, indeed, he gives an example of that truth. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. He says, he says let, me give you, let me illustrate this for you about the power of what comes out of your mouth. He says, if we put a bit in a horse's mouth, we can control that big old powerful horse. We can pull on the rein with that bit in his mouth, and he'll go right. We can pull on it, and he'll go left. We can pull back on both, and he'll stop. We can control that big old boss of a horse with just what's in his mouth. In verse 4, he says, look also at ships. Here's another illustration. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by every, by very small rudder where, where, wherever the pilot desires. He said, look at the huge ships sail the seas. They are large and they are driven by fierce winds, strong winds, but they are turned in the direction that the captain of the pilot wants it to go based on a little small rudder in the back of the ship. Likewise for your life. If you want to get victory over something in your life, you got to stop. You keep trying to stop doing this and stop doing that. Get your mouth under control. Go on and preach, Pastor. Okay, I'm, I'm going to try. If you can just get your mouth under control, we can get everything else. That's the power of the tongue. That's the power of the tongue. Say power of the tongue at me. But in verses 5 through 12, he talks about the problem. The tongue has some problems. Here's what he says in verse 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. He starts off by telling us it's a little part of the body, but it talks, it boasts. It, it makes mountains from molehills. It makes promises it can't keep. It makes claims that are often not true. 
Sometimes your tongue speaks things that it cannot, that the rest of the body can't fulfill. It's a little member, but it boasts great things. It says in verse 5, see how great a forest, a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire, verse 6, a world of iniquity. Look at that. It's, a, it's fire. It's a, somebody say it's a fire. It, it causes big fires. It's, 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 it, it causes problems and drama and pain. It's a problem. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. It's full of sin. Your tongue is full of sin, full of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members, verse 6, that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Listen, that one verse right there is speaking so much. It says that it is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. What comes out of your mouth can defile all of you, corrupt you, mess you up, and it sets on fire the course of nature. What, what comes out of your mouth ignites your passions. What you talk about, what you say gets you flowing and desiring things you have no business desiring. And it is set on fire by hell. That means it is influenced by hell. Before you speak something, here's what you need to ask yourself. Is what I'm about to say that has come to my mind that I'm about to utter, I need to ask myself the question, did, what, did this thought, are these words I'm about to utter, did they come from heaven or did they come from hell? They come from one of the two locations. They're either influenced by God, his power and presence, or it's influenced by hell. Some of us don't know what the difference is. We can't make the distinction, and so we'll speak whatever comes to our mind. And then got the audacity to say, well, I'm speaking the truth. It's how I feel. That's what I think about it. Here's what the Bible says, is that a fool utters all his mind. Y'all ain't going to like me after today. But all, I'm walking right down through James. I didn't make any of this up. This was all here when I got here. And that's what James is saying. He is making the declaration that it is set on fire by hell. The devil, the devil knows how to talk to you and get you to say some things because some of you don't have no filter. You don't have the ability to filter through what you should be saying and what you shouldn't be saying. Everything is not the right thing to say. Some of y'all say, well, it's the truth. Yes, yeah, something is truth, but that don't mean you should speak it all the time. There's truth in here on everybody that you don't want repeated to all the time. Everybody in here got something on them that they don't want nobody else to hear about or know about or to repeat. Don't look at me in that strange void look, in that strange look. I'm talking about you up to your face. And so James says, it is set on fire by hell. But then he, then, and then I like what he says here. He talks about the fact that the tongue cannot be tamed. It is untamable. Look at verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Think about that. The large things, the large animals, the small animals, all kinds of animals that have been tamed by man. Big whales, you can go to sea world and see big whales who are under the control of a man who have given instructions and they obey what the trainer tells them to do. Look at the big elephants that are in the circus. Look at the huge animals that have been trained. Lions, stick your head in the mouth of the lion. He won't clamp it down. I'm not putting my head in there, but somebody putting their head in there. Not me. Any way you look at it, it's still an animal. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, it's still an animal. And James says, every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed. It has been tamed. Verse 8, but no man can tame the tongue. We can control these big, huge animals, but you can't control that little red thing in your mouth. Nothing's worse than to be around a person who can't control their tongue. Here's what the scripture says. The scripture says it's better for a man to live on the rooftop of a large house in the corner than in a wide house with a nagging wife. I thought the brothers would stand up and say, preach on, pastor. That's the scriptures. It's the scriptures, it's the word of God, because... <laughs> Some women can't learn to shut it down. Bring it in. 
come on, everybody try this right. He said, bring it to a close. Shut it down. Close it up. I feel an anointing with that little move right there. It's a problem. Look at your neighbor and say, it's a problem. It's a big problem. It's problematic. He says, matter of fact, he says here in, a, uh, in verse number eight, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an, an unruly evil. And the word unruly right there means it has no constraints. Y'all better be careful about somebody who has no constraints on what they'll say. He says it, it, is, a, it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Some of you are spewing out poison over people, spewing out poison in your marriage, spewing out poison over your kids. Some of you are spewing out poison over yourself. You haven't learned to speak well to yourself. One of the things the scripture says is that when David got to a place of discouragement, he learned how to encourage himself. You got to learn how to encourage yourself when you, when you, when you don't see no hope and you don't know an answer. You got to learn how to speak hope to you. You got to learn how to look at yourself and say, I'm coming out of this. It looks bad. It looks difficult. It looks tough, but I'm coming up out of here. I don't know how long it's going to be, but one day I'm coming up out of here. I ain't going to be like this all the time. It's tough now. Money's low. Stuff is tough right now, but I'm coming up out of here. There's going to be a bright day. It looks dark now, but the sun is still shining. I'm discouraged now, but I'm going to encourage myself. I'm going to keep pushing, keep going, keep making the right choices. So many of you are reactionary, but you got to learn to speak to yourself, speak over yourself, encourage yourself yourself speak the word to yourself stop spewing poison into yourself and into others so James says to us today it is an untamable unta untamable and is full of poison it's unruly and the thing about the poison of your tongue, it may not kill anybody instantly, but it is a slow poison that is slowly sapping the life out of your relationships, out of your life, out of your future, because you keep on speaking negatively and speaking the wrong things and you'll never have life. God started talking to me about this the other day. I was doing chapel before the Washington Wizards played the Miami Heat. Y'all know I'm the chaplain for the, the Washington Wizards. And in, in football, when you do chapel, chaplains for professional teams, the football teams have separate chapels. So all the teams meet together. You know, the one team and all their players and coaches and, and the other team does a separate chapel. But in basketball, it's different. Both teams come together. So I was doing chaplain for the the day that the Wizards was playing the Heat, and when I finished my dynamic message, I turned to the Heat players and I said, y'all going down today. <laughs> and the Wizards went out there and spanked the Heat. <laughs> and I thought to myself, maybe if I said that before every game. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, there's power in your tongue. Verse number nine says this, with it we bless God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Here's what James is saying, with that same mouth, that same tongue, we both bless God and curse men. We come in here and worship God. Got our hands up and our mouth giving him a glory. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to God. <laughs> Leave here and get out in our car and cut somebody out in the parking lot. <laughs> if y'all all clap together, nobody will know I'm talking about you. As a matter of fact, he goes on about this point and says in verse number eight, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brother, my brethren and sisterin, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? 
Can a fig tree, my brother, bear olives? Or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. You don't, you don't have good water and bitter water coming from the same place. He said, that ought not be the way you are. Now, I feel the tension in the room. There's a lot of tension in here. I feel, you know, there's no celebration. Nobody jumping and shouting. Nobody's, ain't nobody bring no money up here, nothing like that. <laughs> there's tension in the room. And here's why there's tension, because some of you know you're guilty. And the question is raised, how can you have both bitter and sweet coming from you when the scripture is making a definitive statement that that's problematic? A good tree bears good fruit, a bad tree bears bad fruit, but a good tree will not bear bad fruit, and a bad tree will not bear good fruit. Why then do we got both kinds of water gushing out of your being? Woo! It's tension in the room. It's tight. I'm going to tell you why. Let me close with Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 says this. I want to read verse... Before I read it, let me, let me give you the background of what it's talking. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. They are the religious people who perpetrate religious, but they have no relationship with God. We've got some descendants of the Pharisees living among us today. They go to church, but they don't have no real relationship with God. They go through the motions of worship, but there's no real worship that they give toward the Lord. They're not sincere or, or genuine about walking with God. They just want to follow the rules and check it off on their list. I went to First Baptist today, they say. And he's talking to them and he's saying, either you're going to be a good fruit or bad fruit. Either you're going to be a good tree or a bad tree. And then he says, Here are the, here's the words right here that answers this question in verse 34. I'm done. I'm coming to a close. I'm bringing my plane in for a landing. I'm running out of here because y'all going to get mad when I read verse 34 right here. He calls the Pharisees a brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? Here it is. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Y'all missed a great spot because here's what he's saying. What comes out of your mouth is a reflection of what's in your heart. Wow. Here's what he's saying. You can't change your mouth. You cannot tame your tongue. Your tongue can't be tamed because you don't change your tongue by changing your tongue. You change your tongue, what comes out of your tongue, by changing your heart. And the nastiness, and the cursing, and the lies, and the gossip, and I go on down the list of all of the nasty, evil, poisonous things that come out of your mouth are a reflection of what's in your heart. Now, y'all may not want to admit it, but your hearts are nasty. Matter of fact, here's what the scripture says. Our heart is desperately wicked. But here's the great news. Our hearts are wicked, but we serve a Savior who lays us down on his operating table, cuts us open, reaches down and pulls out that cold, stony, hard heart, replaces it with a heart of flesh, sews us back up, and when you get back up, nobody can tell you've been operated on. Hallelujah. When he gets done with you, he has put compassion in you that you never had before. He gives you an understanding and patience with people that you never had before. Go on and preach, Pastor, preach. Yeah. 
When you allow Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, to have your heart, he takes your hardened heart and gives you a heart of flesh. Here's how I know I've had surgery on me. Because he's given me the ability to speak well of people who I know can't stand me. I know I've been changed because he's given me the capacity to have compassion for people who don't deserve compassion. I know he's done it for me. And some of you are here today and your hearts are not there and you'll never change what comes out of your mouth until you let God change your heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Some of you need a heart transplant. And our God is doing surgery this morning. I'm sorry, this afternoon. And it's time for you to get your heart transplanted. Today's dynamic message from Pastor Jenkins is one that has the power to change your life. But it can only do so if you have a heart and soul that belong to Jesus Christ. Perhaps you want to be able to make such a claim, but you don't know how. It's simple. You just have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again with all power. Your sins are now forgiven and you're part of the family of God. Welcome. Maybe you're already saved and in need of a church home, one that will nurture your growth and development as a Christian. Or perhaps you were once in fellowship with God but have since drifted away and are ready to return to your first love. Whatever the case, we'd love to have you become a part of the First Baptist family. Simply contact us at 301-773-3600 or visit our website at www.fbcglenarden.org for more information on any one of our four convenient services or our 100 plus ministries designed to meet your most intimate needs. First Baptist Church of Glenarden, where God is developing dynamic disciples.